The first time I played Sticker Star, I was in a bad place. I was left behind while other people I normally vacationed with went off to Hawaii without me. Anyone else I knew was similarly busy with cool things they couldn't include me in, and I was going to be alone for two weeks. My apartment building was struck by lightning the first day of my loneliness, destroying my internet and cable for several days. Plus, it just so happened my phone didn't get reception where I lived. Then, I woke up with the flu the following day and couldn't eat. I needed something to do that I could actually manage. I bought a copy of The Last of Us, intending to play that. But it required a system update to play, and I had no means of connecting my PS3 to the internet. So now I needed something else. I passed on Fire Emblem Awakening, which I considered buying on sale, and I chose Sticker Star instead because Paper Mario was one of my favorite series of all time, and I needed to feel good about something. I had to like a new Paper Mario game. The following week was horrible. Painfully coughing, always in pain, barely eating, cut off from my friends, and realizing more and more of this game was somehow even worse than I already thought it was. I'd reach puzzles or boss fights, not have a clue which stickers I needed, and try everything until I got frustrated enough to get my sick ass out of bed, grab my phone, and walk down that sidewalk until I had one bar of reception to look it up. I felt so weak. It was hard to justify going back to the store, potentially making other people sick in the process, and buying another game. And who's to say I wouldn't waste my time buying a game that needed a system update like I already did? I had to finish this one because of sunken cost fallacy. I'd played this thing so much already, might as well finish it, right? The next chapter has to be the one where the game gets good. It just has to be. It can't be this bad. Instead, I was locked in a cycle of being dumbstruck and asking myself, how do you seriously put something like this into a store for people to buy with money? This game was a major contributing factor to a terrible week of my life. I just wanted to unwind with a good game so I could forget about everything going so badly. Was that so much to ask? That's what games are for. Well, here we are. It's the end of Sticker Star. Even though the experience was almost totally joyless and routinely disappointed me in new ways the whole way through, nothing I'd been through could have prepared me for the ending of this game. So here it is, motherfuckers! The final chapter! May God have mercy on our souls! Chapter six! I would complain about there only being six chapters, but I was begging for it to be over. Kate Cliff. Uh-oh, a dead end. Guess we'll just have to go. I can't believe that worked. It really lets you just leave. We use the royal stickers to summon Satan. No, seriously. Okay, moving on. We're booted back out because we can't reach the castle. While we're out on the map screen, I've gotta take a detour back to World 5 real quick. Many of you inform me of this absolutely unforgivable goof that I didn't show in World 5. Here's another playthrough of Longfall Falls. Did you get that? The Cheap Chomp has its speed increased after you found both level exits to the point where it's unfair and will often one-hit KO you even if you are moving at top speed to avoid it. So this means even if you like this game, there's an entire level you can make nearly impossible to complete by just playing the level again. In a Mario game! Cream of the crop! How did they not catch this or ever patch it? But okay, back to the mission at hand. We cannot enter the flying castle unless we can fly ourselves. Seems legit. We have to go and find a friend who can fly. But my only friend is Wiggler. Yee, just like old times. Like the time when Wiggler took you two on his back to that poison island, remember? You know that was just a little while ago, right? Oh, is that so? Flutter's childhood memories feel like so long ago. Okay then, let's go! And there we are. I'm serious, that was the whole first level. At least the next one's better. 
Bowser Jr.'s Flotilla. Dad was pretty angry when I told him how you beat me up for no good reason. He was spitting mad. I bet he didn't say anything though. We've got our Mario airship level. Music's pretty good too. For all the dickish projectile hurling enemies in this thing, rocky wrenches aren't bad. They don't move and their projectiles are a joke to avoid. Yeah, probably the easiest enemy was introduced in the finale. We get these shiny new tail stickers everywhere and the concept is pretty cool. You just swing your tail and a projectile either disappears or gets redirected back at the enemy. Sure, that did a lot. We've seen too, too many airships in Mario before, but this one's pretty original. <laughs> That's it, just bonk on a bullet. <laughs> they don't even count as real enemies. In what's possibly the dumbest plan ever, we take a missile launcher, turn it around, and make the ship blow itself apart while we're still on it. Mario just dusts himself off at the sight of it, which is pretty cute. It's not like the story had any tension or drama anyway. We know they'll both be fine. Then we get to our big showdown with Bowser Jr. He puts up a barrier so our attacks can't do much. It's obvious we're in a boss fight that tests our skills with our new tail. Congratulations, this is the second time you've qualified as having boss design. Not bad for 15 attempts now. The fight's pretty fun and sure beats all the lame bosses we've had so far. It's a shame they only figured out how to make a boss fight right before the end. That airship was all right. I'd say it was good. Junior was the only boss fight I had any fun with and the level itself was creative. You know, maybe this will finally get good. The buildup was pretty epic. Some levels have been good and it's the finale. They always save their best for the end. Bowser's Sky Castle. Kamix back for more. Well, it's the exact same third rate boss fight as chapter two. He doesn't even have higher stats. He has 20 HP. Your second to last boss is verbatim the chapter two mid boss. The only difference is Kamek splitting into three, so we gotta figure out the real one. Oh, never mind! That's what would happen in normal RPGs. You can't select targets in this game, so it's just blindly attacking until you eventually hit the right one. Aren't you so glad Kamek is here? Such a worthwhile character introduction. I'm so glad Kamek was one of only three characters they dedicated energy to making. And now he's dead. Like, he actually died. Well, that sucked, but after that, we get a whole ass sky castle to run through and our final level is a straight line. That's seriously it. This time lapse is the entire level. According to interviews, they intended for mini games like the stuff you did in Bowser's Castle and Paper Mario 1. They cut it from the final game because I guess they thought that would be fun and memorable or would give the ending any sense of finality. This for a final level somehow managed to still disappoint me after everything else. I was expecting a little more going on for the big finish than nothing. Oh boy, my favorite Bowser quote from this game. I want to add that Miyamoto was quoted saying he hated the way the developers of this game treated Bowser. The man's innocent, just saying. It's the final fight with Bowser, and it's horrible. It's no hyperbole to say this is the worst final boss fight I've ever played in an RPG. It's an RPG, a bad RPG. But I guess I don't see a lot of bad games through to the end, so there's probably a worse one out there somewhere. Each of the five phases of this thing, by the way, is unenjoyable for different reasons, so it's impossible to make a blanket statement for the whole fight. Instead, we'll go through it point by point. Bowser's first phase involves him summoning enemies that keep respawning. The damage on all of them working together is pretty steep, so they mean for you to use the tape or stapler to shut the doors the enemies come out of. The game never told you you needed these. Did you expect it to start now? Bowser also has, frankly, a ton of HP. So high damage thing stickers are a must for the fight as a whole. 
I feel anyone would bring high damage stickers to a final fight, and it's their fault if they didn't. We've been through this song and dance enough by now, so the game gets a pass on that part. They're captive and have to listen to my horrible playing! <laughs> In phase two, a Womp guards Bowser and must be destroyed. Every hit does one damage to the old block, and he must be hit 50 times, so you need multi-hit stickers, or you could wait for him to fall over and use the scissors as comically shown on his back. The game never tells you you needed this ahead of time, and it's realistic that you didn't bring any good multi-hit items when trying to stock up on thing stickers, so you have neither of his weaknesses. Phase three has Bowser commanding fireballs to hit you, which hurt for a lot. It's possible to weaken them with the refrigerator, the shaved ice, or the fan. You guessed it. Game never indicated you needed to bring these either. It's not so much the requiring of powerful items to win, that's fine. It's just all these damn specific checks for them. Phase four needs you to use tail stickers, which the chain chomp gives you if you don't have any. One hit, he's done. That one's fine, I guess, and you probably even have a leftover tail from Bowser Jr.'s airship. The final phase is the most complex and the most suckish. Okay, so like, Try to follow along here because this goes places. Bowser becomes a giant and things get really heated up after that. You can't do much to hurt him. He's too strong. Kirsty pops out of her hat and decides she needs to die right here and now. Wait, what? <laughs> that was a pretty big tonal whiplash from how everything was before this. She decides to sacrifice herself and becomes a sticker because only a sticker from the sticker star could ever match Bowser's power. Even though we spent the whole game collecting the five rail stickers we could use instead. Uh, never mind. Go ahead. Whatever kills you faster. I'll match the A button to make it come sooner. I've earned this. Her final words are that she'd never forgive you if you sold her in a shop. Turns out if you do, she's canonically worth 15 coins. I rolled my eyes at this moment. Maybe I'm a horrible person for this, but Kirsty's death was one of the rare times I thought this game was really funny. <laughs> that might sound harsh, but Sticker Star suddenly trying to force me to feel sad over the abrupt death of its obnoxious useless hint system is so baffling, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> this fictional sticker lady is so useless to the point where her living or dying is of no consequence. I recently gained an even greater dislike for this section because it was so hard to figure out what to even say about it. It can be pretty sensitive territory to say that a death scene made me laugh, and this was genuinely hard for me to talk about. It's just so forced. They had this armchair quarterback boss me around for the last 20 hours, and then killed her off with nothing in between. It all just made me think, they're really going for this, with this character. Okay, man, fuck Kirsty. Moments solely made to make people cry really stand out to me. I can see why this fight needed something big to happen, as good final battles have a shifting balance of power that goes back and forth. I would say that they could have picked any other character for this, but that's the thing. There are none. This is a consequence of not making characters. She's the only character they can try to make us feel for, and Kirsty never did anything to make herself admirable. Heck, she never did anything to make herself helpful either. The story isn't built up to this moment. None of this is sad. It's schadenfreude that I never have to listen to her inane drivel ever again. And laughter that this complete non-story thinks it can pull off having emotion at 11.59 PM when they put in no effort before this. It feels like I'm being told what to feel rather than just feeling it. About the only thing that feels genuine is the part where she says she's sorry for making me go on this adventure, which reads more like a meta joke about the quality of this game. I guess you could say she fell flat. Though I have to admit, and I know some of you are waiting for this, this moment is brought up significantly by the amazing song, Spectacular Finale. I guess even the composer was celebrating Kirsty's death in style. I mean it when I say this is one of the best Mario songs ever. And if the goodbye held actual weight, I'm sure people would have cried their way through this fight. It's awesome! But hey, the bitch is dead or something, so back to the battle. Now that we can hurt Bowser, you must destroy! Oh god. 
god. Bowser's arms! Just when it seemed like this game would only ruin turn-based Paper Mario, it manages to besmirch my favorite thing in Super Paper Mario as well. I decided to try this boss fight without any special thing stickers to see how far I could get, and I just barely failed to win at this phase. I ran out of stickers and... Run? I can kill Bowser by doing nothing! I'm saved! Or not. If you run out of stickers, they give you a run button that doesn't work so that you can slam your face into the concrete. Because Mario's turn ending gives you a free sticker, and they have to give you some way to waste your turn to make that happen. This was their solution to making every attack a consumable. On our second attempt, I want to recommend the Boom Box. Though not required, its effect to double your attack power really saved me here. It will at least make you not have to use as many stickers to win, which you're probably pretty low on. All of this is horrible. That's what, like, five specific rare stickers they want you to have for this fight with no indication you needed to bring them at all beforehand. And that's in addition to needing to bring lots of high damage stuff to outpace his attacks. Bowser deserved better. He's four unfun boss fights from this game mashed into one. As I alluded to earlier, yes, this is the only boss fight in the whole game that you aren't allowed to run from after seeing what it's like. Without bringing a guide, your only option is to fight, hit a brick wall you had no way of predicting, die, go get the sticker you needed from town, fight again, hit another brick wall, and die until you've seen all the phases. Plus, this is assuming you even know the effects of the thing stickers. My first time, I had no idea they had effects. They nuked every fight up to this point in one turn. The enemies were already dead, so wait, these things had effects? What? They do anything besides damage? If you don't know the effects of the stickers, much less have the right ones, this fight drags on, and I've seen multiple streamers get stuck here for over an hour. Seriously, how do people figure this crap out? Who has the patience to go through all these and see what works best? The only thing I can say to the final boss fight's credit is that the thing stickers they intend for you to beat Bowser with are pretty hard to miss. So 99% of players will at least be able to buy them at Sling a Thing once they find a list. This is like all those times where they put sticker checks at the end of a level, but for a level you can't quit out of. Then as if this wasn't the worst final Bowser fight ever, Bowser never said a single word in this whole game. This bit I did earlier, it wasn't a joke. I think that's the worst part. Waiting for him to open his mouth and be hilarious and hammy, but getting nothing. The level before him was nothing. The second to last boss, was nothing. The finale was the fucking worst level in this whole game. Sticker Star managed to keep getting worse all the way to the end. In World 6, I only enjoyed the airship, which means our final good level count is 8 out of 39. I enjoyed 20% of this game. Thank you, good levels. Thank you. Now let's get that princess! Oh my god! A main character said something! Now let me tell you why Paper Peach sucks now! Paper Peach was one of my personal favorite characters. She was a far cry from Peach in the main series, always taking things into her own hands and doing what she could in the face of bad situations, eventually even becoming a great hero of legend alongside Mario himself. Honestly, she was kind of a badass. Here she gets three lines. She gets kidnapped, she shows up at the end, and says congratulations. That is all. She means nothing and changes nothing. Her capture isn't even the main conflict, since that's getting the sticker comet back from Bowser, and he just used that power to get Peach on the side. I can't even remember a time where any Toad cared she was gone. They were all too busy talking about how hilarious it is that they're made of paper. You could actually remove her from this plot and nothing would change. Bowser still does everything he does by merely having the sticker comment, and that's the main thing we were sent here to fix. Dude, now that we met Peach, I just realized. Sticker Star managed to ruin Toad, ruin Peach, ruin Bowser, ruin partners, 
and ruin turn-based battles in the span of one game. All while actively trying to create something good. That's astounding failure. We end with the party at Princess Peach's castle that she was trying to hold the day everything went awry. Yup, it's just Paper Mario 1's ending again. Look at all the friends we made, everybody's here! Toad number 642, Toad number 347, even Toad number 97324! Oh, but I'm glad the steward came, he's pretty cool. Bowser tries to steal the sticker comet again. Hardy har, Bowser. And Kirsty is alive again. They hand wave away everything by saying Mario wished for this to happen. So even her death is pointless and means nothing. It really was just weak, unearned drama in a story that doesn't support it. You might question why Mario even liked her enough to do this when he could have wished for anything else, but I'm actually in agreement with him on this one. I loved Kirsty dying so much, I wished for her to come back to life because that means someday she can die all over again! It's time for the end credits. Poor Luigi, man. You thought his role was small in Super Mario 64? Ouch. He was demoted to an Easter egg who never says a word. You only get to see him lead the parade at the end if you find him in all five stages he's hiding in. Yeah, you have to unlock the series tradition. I guess they had to give him one last middle finger before the year of Luigi that kicked up a couple months after this game was released. You know, I guess that means they ruined Luigi too. In the credits, we see this game had 12 writers. Twelve! Eleven are people who worked only as writers. With how little text there is in this game. I can't explain this. We're not done yet, though. Sticker Star has a post-game. Something I'm sure barely anybody played. It also sucks. Being brief with this, the sticker grounds were repaired and you earned bonuses for achieving various milestones. I did horribly and I'm proud! As for this banner that says we somehow collected zero stickers. Remember that guy I said I wanted to save under the fountain all the way back at the beginning of this thing? I guess I sort of forgot while complaining about everything else. Damn, that's some impressive vitriol. He was down there for months. This toad opens a sticker museum you're meant to donate one of each sticker type to. This is up my alley and one idea I was glad stuck around in future games. But for this specific one, I never wanted to play the game enough to complete it. Your reward for cataloging all 160 stickers is a sound test and a bestiary. Who cares about a bestiary when you already have 100% and have no reason to ever fight another enemy ever again? I don't know, maybe it would have been a little helpful if some in-game resource told you the weakness of enemies and bosses a little bit sooner. Hmm? It's cemented as one of the most useless rewards for 100% completion when most games start you off with this basic feature. I'll praise the sound test, though. Or... I would have if they actually bothered to put the whole soundtrack in. They only put 29 tracks out of 78 into the sound test. So good job! 37% of the way there is more than the amount of the game I enjoyed. They left out Snow Rise and Spectacular Finale, but gave us all these forgettable cutscene songs instead. There's a couple hits here, but come on. If it doesn't have Snow Rise, I'm just gonna go on YouTube and listen instead. You couldn't even showcase the music right, and it's one of the few positives of this game. I'm done! Paper Mario Sticker Star is the greatest disappointment in Nintendo's history. Nothing else even comes close to this divide between expectation versus reality. No other Mario game is this insipid and gluten-free with a side of diet soda. It comes off as an obligation that was commissioned due to how well it would sell, but no one had any idea what to do with it. And then it somehow wasn't cancelled when it wasn't coming together. It's excruciating to play, with only a few fun parts to make up for it. Basically, every new idea flopped. And the worst thing is, it's long. This is a great example of how games can be too long for what they are. Some people point out the new games have humor and great music, so you can't say they're all bad. But to that I say, you know what else had amazing music and good jokes? The old Paper Mario that also had better gameplay and stories. I think people lump Sticker Star in with its sequel and assume Sticker Star is funny too. Not really. He doesn't even try. Sticker Star has what? Like four jokes in its whole runtime? And one of them was Kirsty dying? But even if it did have some good jokes and a few good songs, so what? That isn't a game. 
Aside from saying this installment has the worst backtracking in the series, which it does, and has a worse version of the original's plot, which it does, at no point in this entire review until now have I ever compared Sticker Star directly to the original trilogy. I didn't feel it was necessary. It's a bad game even when taken on its own. It's just worse if you win in expecting Paper Mario 4, which, by the way, is what they advertised it as. But, okay, let's throw away all of that. And let's say that there was a creative vision for a cute little arts and crafts themed game for the kids. No real strategy or depth, and you can just skip past everything if you really want to. Great, make a new franchise. This would be like if the next Dark Souls wasn't remotely about anything people liked about Dark Souls, and their justification was, well, we aren't officially referring to Dark Souls as an RPG in our company's press releases anymore. We've decided to officially refer to Dark Souls as a farming game from now on, so you can't criticize it for failing as an RPG. Oh, and we aren't gonna make games like the old style for the next 10 years or let anyone else make one because this is our new vision but we are going to advertise it as a main sequel to those games because we still want the fans to buy it. Oh, and the new farming direction has no strategy or resource management and won't resemble a farming game in any way. So even people who like farming games won't like it either. Because artistic vision? I've seen people say, you're an adult. This game is for kids and that's why you can't understand it. The original Paper Mario was my first story driven game and it was so simple I could pick it up at the age of 10. The story got me pumped up, and they kept pushing the envelope and iterating so much on it that the sequels continued to impress me as a 14 and a 17 year old. I've replayed those games in my 20s and could appreciate the battle system and characters even more so than I could as a kid. And that's saying a lot because Paper Mario inspired me as a child. I drew the characters all the time. It was a contributing factor to me wanting to be an artist at that age. I would theorize about what was going to happen next. The old games took their audience seriously. They didn't just go, it's for seven year olds, so who cares? I think kids are smart. Kids know when they're being talked down to and when they're being left out of the real fun. Seeing something this important fall this far sucked. And that's what I find the most disgraceful. This isn't just Paper Mario. This is Mario. Freaking Mario, the single biggest icon in video games. This is, without a doubt, one of the shoddiest products to ever feature Mario's face on the front cover. Mario deserves to have great RPGs, and until this came along, he did. I know some people feel like I'm beating a dead horse by continuing to talk about Sticker Star, and fair enough. But the series continued on this path for 10 years. I genuinely thought in 2013 after playing this, well, Sticker Star was awful, but at least they won't do it again. I couldn't believe how wrong I was. We'd get a new Paper Mario game, and even if it was at least better than Sticker Star, that's not exactly a high bar, and I don't consider that much of a defense. If anything, I found it more frustrating that Color Splash and Origami King had real potential and some good parts, but they just refused to allow these games to live up to their full potential and kept holding them to all these bizarre restrictions on how fun or creative the game was allowed to be. Are you serious? You're saying, well, we're not allowed to make the game that fun. Who does that? It didn't stop with Paper Mario either. We had Mario and Luigi get increasingly plain as the decade went by and we landed on a subpar remake of Bowser's Inside Story. Then the developer went bankrupt and we haven't heard from that series since. It just wouldn't stop. My opinion of Sticker Star kept getting lower the longer we went in this direction and how much more hopeless it looked. So I kept having new things to say about this thing I cared about. This next part is something I wrote mere days before the announcement of the Thousand Year Door remake. I left it in because I like how it reads now. I said, Sticker Star damaged Mario's reputation, badly. There's a reason why people are so averse to these RPGs trying new things now. I can respect the folks at Intelligent Systems for experimenting a little, since I consider Super Paper Mario to be a high point that wouldn't have happened if they just made every game the same way. But I think it's time to give what worked before another shot. It's been 19 years. We've had 
four consecutive games that are drastically different from the original two. It would actually be the least stagnant thing in the world to give the old stuff another try. Instead, we have a series that's so stagnant, it's repeating the same mistakes for the third game in a row now. I don't see how going back to its roots now would be any more stagnant than that. Pretty nice, yeah? Back to the present. The direction we're going in now has me more hopeful for the future. Nintendo's in a good place now. In the previous era, I could not imagine them allowing Super Mario RPG or Thousand Year Door to exist alongside these new games. And we got both of them. It's not uncommon for developers to remake an earlier game to figure out what worked and get things back on track. And yeah, the Mario and Rabbids games are good too. I didn't forget about them. I'm glad I don't have a reason to play Sticker Star anymore. I felt happy when I beat Bowser, which didn't happen the first time I finished it. We're done with this era of Paper Mario. It came to an end right as this review came to an end. Sticker Star wasn't an important step for the series going forward. It wasn't a return to form. It isn't a good introduction to the series as a whole. It fails as an RPG. It fails as a story, at being a Mario game, at being its own thing, and feels like it was made by some space alien who's only heard about what an RPG is like in passing and never saw a Mario game since Mario 3. And I think that's the worst thing entertainment can be. It's unnecessary and it won't be missed.